Hello, and welcome to the Moss Adams presentation, The Critical Impact of Employee Engagement on Business Performance. Before we get started, we have a brief video that will help improve your participation today. Welcome, and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE Progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today. We'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. Presenting today is Mark Starenka. Mark leads Moss Adams Business Consulting Practice and brings more than 30 years experience working with businesses of all sizes and varying structures. He specializes in strategic planning, succession planning, compensation, benchmarking and design, and management, organizational and operational assessments. Around his business performance consulting efforts, Mark is a frequent public speaker and author. He was recently featured in Digger Magazine, the North Bay Business Journal, and Forbes. We're pleased to have Mark provide today's educational insights on employee performance. Thank you so much for agreeing to join us today, Mark. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, I, I don't know about all of you, but uh, it's always flattering to hear someone talk about you, and you wonder if, if, if any of it's ever really true. It's like, okay, so he's been doing this stuff. Let's, let's see if he knows anything. So ho hopefully I'll deliver on, on knowing something. So thank you for joining us, uh, whether it's morning or afternoon in your time zone. We literally have people from Hawaii to New York joining us. So we're flattered that you're taking the time uh, to, to be with us for an hour. We're excited that you have interest in this topic. Um, on the webinar, we've got owners, board members, CEOs, all forms of the C-suite, directors, managers, staff. So we have a, a great cross-section of all facets of organizations and ranging in size from less than 50 million in revenue to over a billion. So it's just awesome. And again, we're flattered that, that you're with us. So this, this hour together really is all about you and, and about how you can strengthen your organization. Uh, as the title indicates, it's, it's really all about employee engagement. And we're going to address that really from a practical sort of how you operate and conduct your business, your organization. And, and how you can make employee engagement a integral part of that and, and why it's so important to 
uh, focus on employee engagement because really that's what's going to drive performance and the success of your organization. And the framework that we go through today is really, you know, it's the result of years of working in this space, but it's really like most, I think, good ideas. It's just common sense, and it just sort of coalesces a, an approach that um, as we go through it, again, it, it's just intuitive and makes sense. But we're talking about it because most organizations aren't good in all of these areas and certainly not in all of these areas sort of at the same time. And, but nothing, not, none of this is rocket science. It's you know, easier said to, than done, but it's all very, very doable. And so we, you know, whenever I attend a webinar or a conference, I hope to just like get one nugget out of this. I, I hope you at least get one nugget out of, out of this hour together. And then the last thing is, please feel free to uh, text in or message in a question as we go. If uh, Tanya receives some and they're you know good questions, she'll she'll interrupt me. She'll pose the question, and I'd love to do that. Um, if if uh, things come to mind for you that you really want to get addressed as we're going, as opposed to waiting until the end. So, with that, let's let's launch in. And, and I'm going to talk about the learning objectives really from the agenda because they're kind of one and the same. And they are, we're going to talk about some of the market factors that are impacting all of our organizations from a people perspective and, and why they matter and why those are critical drivers of performance and in, in in success of our organizations. Why those challenges really necessitate us to take a, a little bit different approach to how we view our organizations and how we present our organizations. And then finally, we'll spend most of the time talking about, okay, so how do we achieve higher employee engagement, how we can do it from a practical standpoint, and why doing the things that we talk about will for sure improve the performance of your organization. And, and many organizations, just as a side note, are very successful. Um, I know Moss Adams would consider itself a very successful business, but that doesn't mean we're living up to our full potential. And what is that potential that we're, we're not uh, achieving? And how can we maximize that and optimize our success? And, and, and I think today more than ever that's important because even though things might be going great today, we know it's a dynamic world and environment, and we, we sort of all need to be on our toes and always looking forward and trying to get better. So before we launch into market factors, we're going to have our first polling question. I'm going to read it to you. It's a simple one. In terms of your human capital, what's the greatest challenge your organization faces either now or in the near future? And your options are replacing institutional knowledge, aging workforce, due to the aging workforce, hiring and retaining qualified employees due to competition and turnover, uh, engaging employees in the business and keeping them truly engaged in, in what they're doing, or all of the above. So select the, the option that you feel best characterizes your, your viewpoint. Please hit the submit button because if you don't, it won't register and we'll give you a, a moment here to, to do that and then we'll click on results. Again, reminder to hit submit, and I'm going to click forward and see what we get for results. So uh, about 7% replacing institutional knowledge, 27% hiring and retaining qualified employees, about 18% engaging employees, about 47% all of the above. Uh, it, I actually think that that's uh, a great dispersion in it's uh, rewarding, and that's not the right word. It's, uh, it's convenient that almost half are, are all of the above, and you'll see that we're certainly going to talk about each of these uh, coincidentally in terms of market factors. So we're, we're going to focus on, in terms of the challenges we're, we are all facing as employers, is population demographics, or what we would call the baby boomer and millennial factors, although we're going to lean more towards the baby boomer, i.e. institutional knowledge challenges, hiring needs, and really a reflection that it is an employee's marketplace and will continue to be so for the foreseeable future, and then why, why we're actually in talking about employee engagement, and it's not just because it's so critical 
to business and organizational performance, but it's really um, a big challenge for most organizations across the U.S. and across the world, around the world, uh, in terms of it's, it's kind of an elusive um, objective uh, in the marketplace. So population demographics. Very simple chart here, sort of the generations, kind of age ranges, median, but really it's looking at this to highlight two challenges within the population demographics. In, in the first case, it's the, the uh, comparison of the baby boomers and Generation X, so the, the generation that's going to take their place. And the, the simple challenge is, is the supply and demand. We've got a lot fewer Generation X than we do baby boomers, which means it's going to be a challenge. It's right there in itself. It's an employee's workforce. Uh, the numbers are in Generation X's favor, uh, and that's going to have all of the uh, anticipated impacts on um, our personnel needs that you would think. It's going to be harder to find qualified people. It's going to be harder to find qualified people who are the right fit for our organizations. It's going to cost more to get them. It's going to cost more to keep them. Um, all good things for employees, all challenges for employers. The second element of challenge within the population demographics, uh, and especially if you think of closely held businesses and even more so family-owned businesses, is the gap in age between the baby boomers and what would be considered their kids, Generation Y. I happen to have five of those Generation Yers. Uh, and if we were a family-owned business, you would say, okay, um, is, are, are my kids ready because uh, that's often the, the baton that's handed, are they ready to take on the business? And often we find, just given that age gap, that the experience might not quite be there to do so. Or think of it another way, if there are not enough Generation X to meet the demand of replacing the baby boomers, then you've got to, in essence, go to the next generation. And so then you run into that same challenge as, do they have the experience, the, the expertise that we need to fulfill those roles? And, and if they don't, which of course in some cases they will, in some cases they won't, how do we how do we address that gap? The second challenge is hiring needs and uh, what the marketplace looks like. Uh, I happen to be in Seattle. Uh, many of the talks like this that I, I tend to give tend to be in, in the West Coast, so this is a little bit skewed towards a West Coast environment. Um, but really, it's, it's looking at what are the top 10 states for hiring needs, what they're projecting, the greatest hiring demand. And in this particular case, we see that seven of the 10, top 10 states in the U.S. are in the West. Uh, however, I think we can also think about areas that, um, for example, are high in de the defense industry and the amount of money that's going to be invested in defense. So think of states like Alabama, for example, where uh, it may not be statewide, but you're going to have major catalysts for employment growth. And so uh, depending on the, the industry you're in, a particular location within states, you're going to certainly have pockets of, of demand exceeding uh, uh, a supply and, and creating, again, those challenges for us as employers. So bottom line, it's an employee's market and we have to deal with that. And before we get to the, the third um, challenge that we're facing as employers, uh, I actually think we have got two polling questions. This is the first one. And so is, does your organization currently survey employee engagement or employee satisfaction? And I would add kind of on a regular basis. Is this something that your organization does? And the simple yes or no. And then please remember to hit the, the submit button. Again, I'll give us another second or two, but uh, a two choice is pretty easy, so I'm going to move us forward. So pretty close to a 50-50 split, so almost uh, uh, election results. Uh, 40, about 48% yes and 52% no. Um, that's actually pretty healthy. Um, split, I, I would say that when I tend to speak in live audiences, 
and, and do the show of hands, which may not be quite as uh, uh, refined as, as probably these results, uh, the, the yeses are typically a lot lower, and so, um, so that's great. And then one follow-on uh, polling question relative to this topic is, how would you characterize your level of employee engagement um, in your organization? And we've, we've broken into three categories, less than 33%, between 33 and 63, uh, and 66, sorry, and, and above 66%. And we've given Ian out also, in case you either don't want to answer or just don't really have a sense, uh, you can click no estimate. But we'd certainly prefer a, a, a kind of a guess on or what you think or how you would evaluate employee engagement. I'll give you a few more seconds to think about that one. So let's see what we got. So largest uh, response, about 56% between 33 and 66%. Um, 20, almost 26% greater than 66%, 8% uh, less than 33, 10% no estimate. So again, that's quite healthy, and, and we're going to give you um, a really good sort of perspective to compare yourselves to uh, on the next slide. So employee engagement, this is the third challenge, and, and, and this is really to give us some statistics about why we're, why we're talking about this and why this is a challenge. So we've all heard of the Gallup polls, the Gallup organization. They've been doing since 2000 an annual employee engagement survey. You can see it's 100,000 workers or more each year, age 18 and over. It's across the U.S. and they're on multiple factors, they're ascertaining the level of employee engagement. And here are what I would call the abysmal or dismal results. Approximately 32% engaged, and that's pretty much held steady since 2000. It basically fluctuates around 32-33%, with 50% not engaged, defined generally as that's someone who comes in, punches the clock, does her thing, goes home, probably does a good job, but it's kind of it's but doing the minimum, no extra effort. I would say, sort of going through the motion. So maybe they do a good job, maybe they do an okay job. They're not doing a bad job, but it's it's kind of the minimum. It's in, Just think of it as not really invested in what I'm doing. I'm kind of just punching the clock. And then 18% actively disengaged, meaning they're the, they're the folks in the organization saying, this is not a good place to be. We should go work somewhere else. Here are all the problems. They're, they're, not, they're, they're a negative influence in the organization. But just think about it for a minute and think about your results uh, for the previous polling question. Imagine if less than a third of your employees are really engaged in what they're doing and really what a discouraging statement that would be. And that's, and that's what these results are year after year. If you happen to be in the manufacturing sector, that number goes down to about 25%. If you happen to be operating internationally, that number goes down to like 15%. And I remember when I first saw these results, was, which were in 2013, I was kind of oblivious to this particular survey prior to that. I just, I was shocked. I thought, how, how could that possibly be? How can an organization be successful with a third of its employees actually, you know, truly engaged in what they're doing? And then the last piece here is just, so there's an est estimate of lost productivity, you know, about half a trillion a year, whatever the number is, intuitively you would uh, imagine uh, and assume that there's a lot of lost productivity if two-thirds of our workers are kind of just going through the motion at best. So flip side of that is a real opportunity, and, and I don't truly think it's that difficult to improve. So... Let's talk about kind of a little bit about what, why we should have a little bit different perspective given these three challenges in the marketplace. So the first is just thinking of your perspective as it relates to the marketplace. And we always think about, as we should, what does the market think of us from you know, a, a business perspective in what we do? How, do they think of us as we, we do what we do 
well. We do it efficiently. We do it effectively, whether they're services and or products, but how well do we serve our customers? But really, if you think about demographics, aging workforce, employee engagement, we need to also be thinking about how does the marketplace view us as an employer, not just for what we do, but as, a, as an employer, employer, as someone who employs individuals, and is this, would this be a good place to be? Because all of those people in the marketplace are potential future employees. Because if we're thinking about we've got an aging workforce, we've got a supply and demand problem, we have employees who aren't engaged, some of which uh, sort of that 18% we probably don't really want here, we have a, a population, a pool of future employees that we need to be um, aligning with. We need to be projecting ourselves in a way where we're viewed positively, we're viewed as a good employer. So basically we need to be kind of in a selling mode of our organization. How are we always, and I don't mean selling it literally, uh, of course not, in, you know, as, as far as an acquisition or buyout, but in terms of, and not selling, like, aren't we great, but we always have to have the perspective of what are we doing to be better, and how would someone from the outside view us, because they may be our future employees. So how would we attract them? Why would we attract them? Why would they be attracted? And Mark, Kind of yes. back to back to that point you were talking about you know selling yourself like internally. So Linda asked the question. She says this is what I worry about most. How do how do I get the baby boomers to stick around and mentor the next generation? Uh, in print, sometimes just by interacting or being present with this important institutional knowledge that will over time evolve to new institutional standards and processes based on technology, communications, and access. However, we need that time period in between covered. So she's asking about the gap. Yeah, that's that's an awesome question, and I'm, I'm going to answer that in, in pieces as we go through this because that's very much something that we need to be able to do, and it's gonna ha it, has a, it can have a compensation component. Obviously, it can have a coaching component, but we do absolutely have to do that. And just think of that in terms of, because you, you, you described it without using uh, the, the following word, succession. It's really all about succession planning. And how do we maintain the sustainability of our organizations over time? And we do have an institutional um, uh, retention challenge with the baby boomers. And we, don't, we not only need to retain it, but as you're saying, we need to be able to transfer it. So I will, I will touch on that as we go. So thank you for asking that question. Um, and then the next, next piece of this kind of new perspective is we also have to be thinking about how we're viewed by your employees. And, and yes, it's culture and, and all that, but we have to be view, taking sort of the lens of, again, uh, promoting the organization, always trying to get better, always thinking that someone um, may be thinking about working somewhere else. A statistic I just read from the Gallup poll uh, yesterday or the day before was that 51% of employees are either seeking uh, other opportunities or looking for openings and other. So they're either, in, they've identified an opportunity that they're pursuing or they're looking for openings. That would be another, to me, kind of an astounding statistic that half of our workforce is in part thinking about not being where they are today. So we always have to be thinking about what's gonna make them want to be here. Um, the question about uh, institutional knowledge transfer is, is a key one. How, how do we retain those baby boomers in sort of the last uh, phase of their career? How do we keep that next wave of, of leadership in the organization in the long term so that they, they become sort of the, you know, the future baby boomers, the future uh, long-term leaders of our organization? So we always have to be thinking about, um, again, it's just how are we perceived? How, how does the market perceive us? because there are potential candidates, how do our employees perceive us, because we got to keep them as candidates, or at least, of course, the ones that, that we want to be there. 
And then just the last sort of perspective on this is, I don't know if any of you have seen the TED Talk. It's by Simon Sinek. It's called The Golden Circle. It's fabulous. Um, and it and really just presents a few very simple concepts. And, and it's really grounded in that great organizations, great leaders are able to inspire their people in the way that they communicate about their organization. And, and the dis distinction between sort of the okay organizations, the great ones is, think of it this way. Every organization knows what they do, right? What products they offer, what services they offer, they know the what, and everyone can talk about that. Some organizations are good at communicating how they do it, kind of what's their differentiating factor, what's their special sauce, their, their IP, but what distinguishes them from someone else. And few focus and talk about why they exist what their purpose is, what, their, what they care about, what they believe in, and, and really just think about why their organization exists. And it's not to make a profit, because for those in the private sector, the, the for-profit, that's, that's a given, right? That, that always should be there. But it's why, why do you actually exist? And if you're focusing on the what and, and, the, and the how, you're not really inspiring people. Or think of it another way, Simon said, my favorite phrase from, from his TED Talk, which you all should go look, just Google uh, gold, Golden Circle, is he asked the question, why do you get out of bed in the morning and why should anyone care? And so you can think of that from your business standpoint to your market, and you can think about that from your employees' perspective to themselves. Why do they get up and, and go to work and, and why do they care? And how can you inspire them to be invested in what they're doing and feel connected to what you're trying to accomplish as, as business leaders? And to do that, you have to be able to focus on the why. Why do you exist? And that, if you can focus on that, can pervade everything. Uh, he uses Apple as, as a good example just of an organization that focuses on why they exist and how they lead with that versus what they do, what products they they uh, they produce, and in getting getting to that nugget of of the why uh, is is what will truly latch on to uh, being able to achieve employee engagement, and that's what's gonna the why is what's gonna pervade what we talk about in terms of how do we achieve employee engagement. So. So Simon kind of has his golden circle. We've got our, our golden formula. This is a very simple concept, just like the golden circle is. It was born out of years of doing this type of work and really just trying to come up with what's, what's a way to just coalesce what are the obvious, basic sort of keys to a high-performing organization and how employee engagement runs through that in terms of being a critical success factor to high-performing uh, organizations. And, and so what this depicts is really there has to be alignment between three things. You have to have, whether formal or informal, some form of plan that says, here's what we're trying to accomplish. We're at point A, we want to get to point B. What does point B look like and how do we get there? You have to define to some extent what performance you need to achieve to get from A to B, and what does that look like, and how do you measure it? And then three, you have to translate what you need from your people, um, number, comp uh, composition, competencies uh, that you need to achieve that performance, and then in addition to that, how you would pay them in a way that would incentivize that performance. And you can't have a conversation with any one of those three really without pulling in the other two topics. And then so that alignment has to exist. And then around that, or we, I'd say, don't bother doing that if you're not going to communicate it. So less than 10% of organizations out there, that's an unscientific number, do these three things well. And even fewer of those do that in a way 
that it, that is communicated to the workforce in a way that engages them. So, for example, if you have some form of a strategic plan in place and you've defined your performance to get you from point A to point B, and you cultivate and compensate your employees in a way that uh, supports that performance, that's you're you know you're you're in the top ten percent. But if that that uh, knowledge um, that information exists just at your board or your senior executive team level, it kind of say, don't bother, because then that's not translating down into the organization. And you need it to translate down into the organization for people to know how they fit in. How do they contribute? If I don't know what you're trying to accomplish, how do I know what I'm doing today is making a difference towards trying to accomplish what the organization is in the business to is trying to accomplish why the organization exists. If that's not conveyed, I can't connect with that. I can only try to guess. So let's talk about each of those pieces a bit. In each, in each case, we're going to focus on the employee engagement perspective of it. So strategic planning. So it's not about having some big formal plan necessarily, but really two things I want to convey. So this shows what would consider a fairly typical but robust strategic planning process. You have your inputs kind of in the first column, your long-range view where you want to go, historical performance, your target customer base, your competitive analysis, uh, your uh, SWOT analysis in, in, internally looking at your cells, looking at what your competitors are doing that you know, in terms of best practices. Then you have your second piece, your goals and strategy and initiatives and your objectives and your uh, strategies and tactics and, and your annual plan. So that's, that the guts of it is your plan. And then, then you have, okay, how are you going to execute that in terms of an action plan and what are you going to measure? But, but set aside the, the components of it or the details of it, again, all a plan really is about, it's not about having a plan, it's about having a roadmap of what you're trying to accomplish. Again, getting from point A to point B. If you can't define that to some level, whether very detailed or very cursory, 30,000 foot level, then how do your employees know what you're trying to accomplish? And so it's all about having a vision and just being able to define, here's where we want to get, and here are the things that we need to do to get there. It's not any more complicated than that necessarily. Then it's just a, a, a degree of detail that you want to uh, address and reflect in your plan. So from, a, from a, a plan itself, it's about just depicting a roadmap. But just as important as that roadmap, and think of that as the product or the output, is the process. Going through strategic planning is an opportunity for you to be introspective and look at your organization and look at the marketplace and really just think about what you're trying to accomplish and get out of the mode of just doing it, right, the day-to-day. -day. But even more importantly, or just as importantly, is the opportunity to engage your employees in the process. And it, it can be very simply done and very powerfully done in one of two ways. You can ask their input on the front end, and when I say their input, I mean every employee in your organization. So for example, you could do a very simple web-based survey where you ask them to identify the top three strengths and weaknesses of the organization. You can ask them um, what keeps them in the organi at the organization. Uh, you can ask all sorts of things that you might want to, but you get two benefits of that. One is, You'll get some insights about your organization that will be useful, but just the mere fact that you asked is going to increase employee engagement because you're showing them that their voice counts and that, that you care about what they think. And very few organizations, very few organizations actually do strategic planning, let alone engage their employees in the process. And it's very simple to do. It doesn't really have to cost you a penny to do. You could do it through SurveyMonkey. And, and it's very powerful. The only big caveat to that is don't do it if there's not going to be some sort of follow-up, right? Don't ask a question that you're not prepared to answer. And that doesn't mean you're going to necessarily do what they suggest. It just means you have to be able to play back for them 
what you ended up doing in terms of a plan. So that's the communication out of it. So you can ask for input in, but then you got to share it. You got to share the plan with your employees, and there's all different ways you can do that. This next slide is an example, and of course you cannot read this, and it's intended that you can't because this is uh, an actual plan. This is about a 70-slide presentation, strategic plan, boiled down to one 11 and a half by 17-inch piece of paper. In the whole, and I'm just going to click through what's here. Their vision, mission, service promise, five-year view, their SWOT analysis, their five-year goals and one-year objectives and metrics strategies, key strategies and tactics, and then they have their year one priorities of who, what, when for each of their strategic initiatives. So basically, it's their whole plan. And I'm not saying that you have to do that, although you could, but the purpose of doing this is twofold. One is to show you that there's no reason that your plan cannot be shared with every employee in your organization, because it's not sharing a whole big document. It can be literally sharing one piece of paper. Uh, the second thing is a plan should be a management tool. You know, it shouldn't be the thing that goes on the shelf. It would be something that you're referring to regularly and you're using to manage the organization and keep it on course, keep it on track of your roadmap. Um, a good example of this, uh, a large physician group uh, went through their first strategic planning recently. They did the strategic plan for, for two reasons. One was to have a roadmap, but one was to give a common vision to their quite large physician base, a few hundred physicians. And they were trying to get them all on the same page, all connected to the organization, in essence trying to increase employee engagement. It just happened to be physicians in this case. And what they did was is they took, the, the, they created their version of this slide, which was a higher level summary of their five-year plan, I think actually it was, it was a three-year plan, and that goes into all of their recruiting materials, every physician that they try to recruit into their practice, they're sharing that plan, it's part of their new employee orientation, so of course they uh, rolled it up a little bit in terms of specificity uh, of what's in that document, but that's now a seminal component of everything that they share and project about their organization. And that's been a very powerful tool to, for them to do to use because that conveys to every potential new physician why they exist, what they're trying to accomplish, and why they would want to be part of it. And it's not it's not about dollars and cents it, that, because that's an inherent piece of it. So the second piece, so first planning, second performance, uh, just a couple simple concepts here. One is, and the primary one is to get you to think about performance at three levels of your organization, enterprise-wide, company-wide, organization-wide, um, at a department, team, project level, depending on your t uh, organization and industry that where you work in, and individual. So enterprise, department, individual. And the concept is here is you want to have all of your employees to some degree focused on each of those three, right? It's not just about what I do individually. I need to think about the broader context. So I need to think about my department or team and what I do helps that group to be successful. And I need to think about what I do that helps the organization as a whole to be successful. So I want my employees invested in all three of those levels. And then we need to define what performance we need so that they can grasp that so that they have something that uh, conveys what performance at each of those levels looks like and what it takes to get there so that I can understand what my role is and how I can contribute to it and, and the, that I have this holistic purview. So I understand the three levels as an employee and I can see how I contribute to it, however big or however little. And one of the ways I think of that is, you know, we, we have our own version of a strategic plan, and we have key strategic initiatives in our organization, and it's a handful at an organization-wide level. And so I can literally think every day, is what I'm doing aligned with these three or five things, and, and, and how am I contributing to that? And it's not like I 
get up in the morning necessarily, even though I should, uh, and, and think, is what I'm doing today aligned with that? Just the mere fact that I can have that thought process, that I know what are what we're trying to achieve, and I can think about whether what I'm doing is aligned with that is is quite powerful, and it gives me um, you know satisfaction that I am contributing. I'm doing something that I know the company as a whole wants to accomplish. Our team wants to accomplish what's expected of me individually. And so, what we try to challenge organizations to do in this regard is to literally identify at an enterprise level, you know, kind of one, two, three, maybe at the most metrics or, or things that you're trying to accomplish and, and what those targets are. And we'll, we'll come back to what, what to measure, but what those targets are of what you're trying to achieve. And then for each function within your organization, both the, the direct outward service to your customers, constituents, clients, and your support services, finance, HR, IT, what performance is required of them to support what we're trying to do strategically as an organization. Uh, it's not the easiest thing to do, but it's definitely possible and it's definitely powerful to be able to define what do we need to do to be in alignment with what the organization is doing as a whole. And the same thing then happen, can happen at the individual performance level that usually shows up in one of two ways. One in, 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 in uh, the form of kind of organization, organizational or core values, i.e. what do we expect um, all employees to exhibit, like developing self, developing others, leadership, communication, that type of thing. <clears throat> or MBOs, excuse me, management by objectives, what things do we expect of each an employee for example, via a performance review to accomplish over the course of the next year, but something that you can measure and something that is supportive that rolls up to what we're trying to achieve um, as an organization as a whole. So three, third piece, so the people part. So we're going to focus on um, three different elements here. So one is just career path. And yeah, throwaway term, and yeah, we talk about career path, but what do we really mean? And this is something that really comes up a lot when we talk about millennials, is they want to be able to see how could I be here in the future. We've talked about the need to focus on why they would want to be there and being able to get them to understand the why and the, and the definition of why, but, but we also need to be able to visualize it. And so how can I see five, ten years from now that I have a role here, that I'll be challenged here, and, and what does that look like? So it's not just talking about what the different levels are in the organization are, but what what those roles actually are, and, and not the I, I guess the not the classic you know you're an employee t today, you're a supervisor or manager tomorrow, but w working with them to see what that looks like. And, but what it's really about is having conversations with them about what they're interested in, what they're passionate about, and being able to visualize and characterize how that, that passion for them can be realized in the organization and what it looks like. And one of the classic challenges within that are the differences between technical and managerial career paths. And how do we, um, how do we convey and accommodate both? And we need both. But often we are fixated on the managerial path. How do I send responsibility in terms of managing people versus how do I ascend in expertise and what I contribute to the organization? And, and so how do we demonstrate each of those and show what that ascension path uh, along a career can look like? So I'm not, now I'm going to layer in to that competency. And so that career path conversation kind of is meaningless if you don't really talk about, okay, so what do each of those steps in the ladder, managerial or technical, look like? What, what competencies do you need to have in order to be able to fulfill those roles successfully? And, and think of it in two ways. How do I, what competencies, competencies do I need to uh, graduate from one to the next and then to be successful in the next? and what's expected of you, employee, to develop those competencies, and what's expected of 
us, the employer, in developing those competencies. And so thinking about um, defining those and, and just picture, uh, example, uh, some organizations are, who are good at this translate this into just think of a grid, a matrix that has levels down the side, the vertical axis, and competencies across the top. And then with each of those boxes, for each, so each level of competency, defining what does that look like? What's the expectation of what type of performance is expected regarding developing yourself, developing others, leadership, communication, team building, technical acumen, you know, on and on, and, and actually defining those so someone can say, yes, I, I have that skill set, no, I don't, and then you can have the conversation about how do you develop it, how do you cultivate that competency, and, and then now, now you're into conversations about um, coaching and mentoring and training and development, and internal training, external training, but you can actually chart now a, a path that's both career-focused in individual development focus to move you along that. Um, we would all intuitively say we, we all must be doing that, but we certainly all don't do that well. And in fact, a lot of us don't even do that, uh, do, a, do a lot of that. We kind of just have the cursory conversation versus delving in and actually having the conversation with the employees about, okay, how do we move you along? How do I help you be successful? And what does that look like? And, and mapping that out. And then, uh, actually, before we get to the last piece of it, uh, it's kind of a, 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 a preparatory question, and, and that is this. I think this is our fourth and final polling question. It is, what type of incentive compensation does your organization utilize? Performance-based? discretionary or none, or you don't have any incentive compensation program, i.e. you just pay salary or um, whether that's salary or hourly. So performance-based, discretionary, or none. Tony, were you going to say something? I am, thank you. So while we're waiting for, for people to submit their answers, uh, we had a comment, and it's kind of a question, but I, th I think you may have touched on it, but maybe they're looking for a summary. It says, it's nice to show the why, but what about those who are simply unrealistic about the timeline to progress along the growth development ascension path? Yeah, so um, so let, let's talk about kind of type A and type B people. Um, in, in, in these terms, type A people being those who are strong advocates for their career, whether it's what they get paid, how quickly they move up to the, to the question, um, what their roles and responsibilities are, et cetera, and type B people who uh, take more of a, a back seat to that in, instead of being sort of aggressive and proactive about it, a more laid back and are, are kind of just go with what's happening. And, and both may be high performers, but one's much more active. So let's focus on that more active aspect. So I'm always, um, you know, we tell our employees, you know, you have to be an advocate for yourself in your career. Certainly um, that also st uh, relates to your compensation. And so those unrealistic, unrealistic expectations can happen for various reasons. Sometimes they're the, the beneficiary of a um, expeditious move to the next level, and then they think, okay, that's the norm, um, or for whatever reason. So one way to combat that is this conversation that, we're, or what I was saying, since we're, it's not actually a conversation, it's me talking, is this career path in these competencies and because that, as an employer, is competencies, the powerful, one powerful element of that is you're able to point to something that says, this is what you need to be able to do to be at this level. Can you do that? Can you, we demonstrate that you're able to do that? And if you can't, okay, then that's one conversation. If you can, then that becomes a conversation then about opportunity. Is it because there's not an opening? Is there, uh, is there because there are other, uh, we can't afford to pay more at this time for, even though you can demonstrate this competency, um, we don't have 
um, the opportunity for you to apply that based on our book of business, whatever it might be. So there might be some impediments to that ascension moving, and it may be capability, i.e. competency, or maybe opportunity, but then at least you can have that conversation. And we usually end up having those conversations with those type A people because they're 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 pushing, and I mean in a good way. They're pushing and advocating for themselves and trying to move up, up you know, in quotations, whether it's technical or managerial, as fast as they can. And so you have to – your our tools in doing that are – what does that career path look like? What are the competencies at each level so that we have an objective way to have a conversation about it? And, and, then, and then it's about, okay, then how do we give them tools to fill in gaps? Training and development, coaching and mentoring, um, uh, job uh, cross-training in the organization, um, back to the question about the baby boomers and, and that knowledge transfer. So that's a, that's a great way pairing baby boomers, and, and I, I'll, I'll just use baby boomers and millennials just as an easy way to uh, uh, characterize groups, pairing them together in, in um, challenging but in a good way, hopefully a rewarding way for a, a, a baby boomer to be able to translate their knowledge to, you know, take someone under their wing, so to speak, and be able to teach them what they've learned. That's, that's hopefully a dual benefit of course, it depends on the individual and kind of what makes them tick, but um, that, that's an ideal pairing of, of, of people to be able to um, have mutual benefit. So Tanya's moving us along to the results. Performance-based, over, slightly over 50%. Discretionary, about 28 None, about 19 um, Again, this group is, I would say, better than the norm because usually the overwhelming number is discretionary in terms of that's, that's how we uh, utilize incentive pay. So that question was a precursor to this. And, and so this is, again, we're on the third piece, the people part of, of sort of this four attributes of high-performing organizations and how to have employee, high employee engagement. And it's to pay them in a performance-based way. So this is about incentive compensation. It's about how do we tie it to performance. And all we're really doing is a, is a couple um, – sort of concepts. One is, so you might have multiple levels in the organization, executive management staff in terms of um, uh, or percentage of pay in terms of incentive compensation. Certainly some organizations, it's the same, so it's X or Y or Z at all levels, and it's just a matter of applying that to their, um, their salary. But, but what are the drivers? So the second concept here is, is back to the three tiers of performance in an organization, company, department, individual, and aligning a portion of compensation to each of those components and weighting the component that people have the most influence over. So executives have most influence at company or enterprise performance. Management typically has most influence about what's happening within their department, their team, projects that they manage, and staff has most influence over what they do individually, just as generalizations. And uh, some organizations will distribute this way. Some will do, uh, thinking of uh, just using an executive example, they'll go 50, 25, 25 as displayed here. Some have done 75, 25, zero, zero meaning we expect all executives to be por performing up to the standard of our core values. Um, 33, 33, 33, um, every sort of version imaginable. There's no right or wrong. There's what fits for your organization. But again, the concept here is trying to get, pull that um, multi-tiered perspective into the compensation front. The, the other, oops, sorry, one, one other point here was just, and then budgeting for this at the beginning of the year. Budget a payout based on the performance do you expect as the organization as a whole, so you're not figuring this out at the end of the year. You're budgeting it uh, over the course of the year. And, and then one final point, and some threshold of net profit should be a trigger for this or a threshold for this to kick in. 
it should not be revenue. There are organizations that do this based on revenue, and then they find out that they don't have the profits to pay it out. Uh, actually, I was giving this presentation last week to a group, an in-person presentation, and, and when we were talking about this, one of the uh, owners said, we actually do it based on revenue, but we have such a uh, tight linkage between revenue and profit that, um, that we're able to tie it to revenue and we're able to share it with employees what our revenue is. Because the, the question that triggered that conversation was, um, what, what are owners willing to share with their employees about company performance? And the question was really kind of profit-based. Do owners share the profitability of their business, and why do they and don't they? And so this one uh, participant said, well, we, we do what we share revenue because we know that if we hit this revenue, we hit this profitability. And I said, well, that's awesome, but you, you, know, you're, you really got to make sure that that is a tight tie and that there aren't um, uh, surprises during the course of the year that um, – create a void, or, you know, a gap between that linkage. So last couple points here, if I can get this to move forward. Communication. So this is just tying back to think of targets and now just what's the actual performance. So if we're able to define in each function within our, our organization what type of performance we need to accomplish at a strategic level, think of kind of an executive dashboard, not tens or hundreds of metrics, but handfuls of metrics at the most, being able to communicate where are we during the course of the year and the actual, the classic green, yellow, red. In organizations who do this well, just think of a classic all-hands meeting where you put up a dashboard of key metrics, and here's where we are today. And, and if you've tied this to compensation and you've communicated that, then now think of the alignment that you have in the organization of knowing where you are at a point in time, being able to have conversations about what you might need to do differently to make corrections to get you on track of your roadmap and how that pulls through to each function and ultimately each individual as they contribute to it. And now, now you've got everyone on the same page. And then just thinking about some sort of communication rhythm for this information. You know, think of strategically, uh, uh, annually, a strategic plan. That's something that we're now saying that's, you, to some extent, you should be able to share that with every employee. That quarterly, we can check in with a dashboard like this on how we're doing. We can drill that down to departmental level or team level metrics where we get more detailed in how we're doing and, and making adjustments, and then down to the weekly activities. But getting your organization on a rhythm of being sharing information, building awareness, and ultimately all we're trying to do is get our employee base engaged in what we're doing. Why are we in business? <clears throat> what are we trying to accomplish? How do you fit into the equation? What do we need from you? How do we help you be successful in that role? So we've connected plan to performance to people, and then we're communicating that that alignment exists and how you fit into it. And if we do that, now we've got a high-performing organization, and no matter how well we're doing today, we will do better tomorrow in terms of not only our performance, but in the people challenges that we're facing in the marketplace, being able to transfer knowledge, being able to retain people, being able to attract the people that we want, because, again, without, without the people, we're, we're kind of nothing, right? So... I'm going to conclude there and see in our remaining minute or two uh, if we have any additional questions that I can quickly answer. Tanya, anything in the yes. queue? We do, we do. So let's see. So from your experience and research, what is the best way for organizations to explain certain jobs or stepping stones if there is no career progression within your organization for certain positions? Yes, no that's... That comes that comes up actually quite a bit. So think of um, uh, engineer. Okay, th that title comes to mind. And let's just say we have an engineer role. Well, okay, can we? Sometimes what we need to do is a you know a junior engineer, an engineer, a senior engineer, engineer one, two, three, where you need to start to break that into pieces 
and, and this, again, so this, uh, I didn't pick this for this reason, but it's convenient. That's on that technical track, for example, or could be just on a technical track. So how do we create um, career? How do we elongate that, um, that pathway for people in that role? And that might feel, on one hand, artificial. Okay, well, we're just taking the role and breaking it kind of into pieces. But um, if those are meaningful pieces, and here's what a you know an entry or junior level engineer is expected to do, and here's what an engineer, and here's what a senior um, engineer needs to be able to do, or a director of engineering. Then we're we're creating that continuum, that pathway, and uh, and, and and that's a great question and example of the things that we need to do to be able to create that vision for employees to be able to see how do I view myself here in five years, in 10 years, how am I going to be challenged? And so, that, but that takes a lot, that takes work on our part to be able to um, define that. And uh, the conveying part is really the easy part, it's the defining it so that we have something to have a conversation about. Do you have, nice. do you have another question in there? Um, I do have, I have one more that we, so can you suggest some publication or book to implement this planning? Or is this really based on Mark's 30 years of experience? When I write my book. <laughs> no, okay. uh, <laughs> no. Um, uh, you know, there, uh, so no, I, I don't have a good answer. My, uh, there are, you know, lots of books I've read that, you know, talk about elements of this. Um, and it's not, and, but this isn't, on one hand, this isn't unique, right? This, uh, to me, this is common sense, and it's just the things that we need to do, and it's just a way of thinking about. I mean, there are other important things to think about in terms of running a business, but I think that these four are seminal elements that we just need to think of together and think of consistently. Um, so, unfortunately, I don't have a good answer to that, um, other than the sort of the smartest answer is that yeah, why. Well, haven't written a book on it yet, but it would be a pretty short book because <laughs> it's pretty, <laughs> pretty, pretty, fairly basic. It's it's just taking the time, making it important, and taking the time to work on it. And and the biggest challenge to that is, right? We're all busy doing our day to day thing, and and so it's it's setting aside the time to work on other things. Um, that's a challenge for all of us, and, and you know, us us consultants included. So I know we're over. So if, if Tanya, I'm, I'm sure you would say, if there are any other questions, we're happy to answer them and, and send responses. So, Yes, thank and you. thank you, Mark, for so much, for helping clarify how employee engagement impacts business performance and highlight the four um, strategies. So, and thank all of you for joining us. You might also con consider connecting with Mark on social media. So if you find you have questions at a later date, he can be a resource for you. And finally, uh, because your participation and feedback helps us improve both our presenters and our offerings, please take a minute to complete a brief survey, just 14 questions, to help us define our efforts. Thank you. Thank you.